Thanks, Lacan. OK, so I'm really going uh, for elementary here. So it's going to be uh, two stories. Or if you want the story in two parts, uh, whether it's going to be a comedy or a tragedy that's uh, sort of up to the audience. OK. So I'm going to talk about sort of really very elementary results. So, and because they're so elementary, they're even going to apply in a slightly more general setting. So I will not really talk about tensor rank, but I will talk about rank with respect to variety. So our setup is going to be like this. So we will have a projective variety. Uh, inside PN. And uh, well, with, with some field, but our field is going to be only reals or complex for this talk. We won't really care about other possibilities. OK, so now let me define x rank of a point in C, or oh, sorry, Kn plus 1. So in order to do this, so let me say, OK, so I have a projective variety, but in fact, you know, so projective variety lives in the projective space. So I will take the cone of a projective variety that's going to live in the actual vector space. So x hat is cone over x. So these are, so what, is, what does this mean? This means these are all p in kn plus 1 such that the class of p is an x. So maybe let me draw a picture. So we have a cone. Yeah, I think this is the uh, this is the canonical picture of a cone. If you ask somebody to uh, draw a cone, this is what they will draw. Uh, this is perhaps limitation of uh, drawing. Okay. So now we have a point. So what is the x rank of p? Well, so I decompose this is equal this is equal to the minimum number k such that I write p as the sum of xi from i equals 1 to k and xi live in the cone over x. Okay, so I have a cone, I have a point somewhere in the space, and then I want to decompose it in the minimal possible way as the sum of the elements of the cone. OK, and uh, so what good is this? So this is essentially, I mean, this definition for different varieties x encompasses all reasonable notions of tensor rank. So examples when x is the segregate or <coughs> The image of the Segre embedding of Pn, this corresponds to tensor rank. When x is the Veronese, this corresponds to symmetric tensor rank. And uh, you know, when x is the Grassmannian, This corresponds to anti-symmetric tensor rank. OK. So, so we're going to work in even more generality. So not just for tensors. We're going to talk about the rank with respect to any variety. Uh, so before, right, so then, then, well, then the question is, well, can we say anything useful in this generality, right? Can we say anything useful in this generality? So before I proceed, uh, are there any questions about this setup? Because this is, this is the notion that I will work with, so uh, we better understand what's going on. Are there any questions? Is everything clear? OK. So, right, so then part one is uh, joint work with Zach Teitler. And what we're going to address is the question of maximum rank. OK, 
so what can we say about the maximum rank of, uh, of a point with respect to variety? Well, you can say something sort of uh, immediately obvious thing that you can say is that max rank is at most n plus 1 because that's the dimension of the ambient vector space. So actually let me just say so I mean I need to in order to define x rank I better assume that x is non-degenerate. Uh, and non-degenerate just means that it actually spans the whole space or if you want the cone spans the ambient vector space. If it doesn't span then you know I cannot really define the rank for every point. Right, some points will be just outside the span, and uh, I will also assume that x is irreducible. Uh, I mean, for I think for many things this might not be necessary, but for all of these examples, in any case, it's the case. So I would say for all relevant, more most interesting example happen to be reducible anyway, so we might as well assume it. Um, no loss. Okay, so max rank is at most n plus one. I think that should be clear because well, just by linear algebra. So can we say something better? So over C, so let's do so for part 1.1, let's work over C or over probably any algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, but let's stick to C, right? So over C, can we say something better? So in fact, we can say that the max rank uh, is at most n plus 1 minus dimension x and this observation was made by I believe Garamita and also by Landsberg Teitler. This is very easy to, to understand that you can get away with a little bit better than just the trivial bound n plus one which basically works all the time. It doesn't matter what field and so on. Okay. So, but, uh, but can, we do, can we do better than this in the general circumstances? So, over an algebraically closed field, tensor, well, now our algebraically cl closed field, and now we forget about tensors, but there is a generic X rank. So, over C, uh, there is a generic X rank. And so what this means is that tensors of generic rank form a dense open subset of Cn plus 1. And in fact, you know, the, the study of what is the generic rank, this is, uh, well, this, that is a very sort of well-established area, perhaps the most, uh, the most famous result is the Alexander Hershowitz theorem. And essentially it gives the, uh, well, one way to say it, it gives, tells you the generic rank, generic symmetric rank. And uh, I mean, there are also there are also many results, uh, many results on the generic non-symmetric rank, although not uh, not a full classification as given by Alexander Hershowitz. And there is, I mean, well, yeah. So this says essentially finding the generic rank is almost the same as figuring out dimensions of secant varieties to x and this is usually done like in the previous talk we are using the Terracini lemma although I mean that's just the first step right the story doesn't end there but you need but usually you need to use the Terracini lemma to get down to uh, actually figuring out what's going on okay but for me you know in, in a sense uh, I don't really, I, I, well, I don't, I'm not going to use this point of view. All that I need to know is that there is a generic X rank, right? That's, that's what I need to know. So what can we say now about the maximal rank and the generic rank? So this will bring us to, let's say, theorem 1. Uh, maximal 
x rank is at most twice the generic x rank. And I'm going to prove this later, but I'm actually I'm going to state more theorems before I do that, and then I will prove more than one theorem with the same proof. Is this sharp? Uh, no. I mean, uh, how should I put it? The, I would I would say well, okay. Uh, let, let me hold off. So after I give the proof, I will make some general remarks. One oh, yeah, and then you will you will see what's going on. Okay. It depends what you mean by sharp. There exists, sharp. Yeah. There exists yeah. examples yeah. Well, of X where you do get twice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but in general this will not really be okay. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah, let me. It says the Landsberg title and Ramita is also sharp. So. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's right. So let let let's just hold off and wait for ten minutes, and I hope you will be more satisfied uh, later. Okay. Um, so this is right. So this is what happens over C. So now, what can we say over R? So actually, over R, the situation is a little bit different, or depending on your perspective, maybe a lot different, because there is no longer a unique generic rank. In fact, over R, there are several ranks uh, for which tensors of this rank uh, contain an open set. Or open subset of Rn plus 1. So now let's think about over R. So here x is going to be a real variety. Uh, and by that I really mean that x better have dense real points. Right? I don't want to think about you know, varieties that are given by real equations, but somehow they don't contain as many real solutions as complex solutions. Right? So real variety, so variety with dense real points. So, yeah, so what can happen? Well, so imagine this is our space Rn plus 1. Then it happens that perhaps here is an open ball and these, these guys have rank 3, and here is an open ball, these guys have rank 4. So there are several, there are, often happens that there are several ranks such that tensors of such a rank contain an open ball, and such ranks are called typical. So let me use SR. This is the set of tensors, not tensors, vectors. This is, there are no tensors, so everything. Vectors of rank R. And then the definition, so rank R is called typical. <coughs> if SR contains an open ball in Rn plus 1, and open ball, I mean, in the usual Euclidean topology on Rn plus 1. Does, does Renko mean that there's a, you know, an R piece expression preserved by complex conjugation, or that the sum of R real things? Oh, no, 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 that's right. So this, yeah, so when I say, yeah, so real rank, it means that all of these sum ends are real. So it's not conjugacy invariant one, but really one consisting of real, real underlying vectors. Okay. Any questions? Are we all on the same page here? Okay. Uh, so now, so what can we say? What can we say uh, about typical ranks and the maximal ranks? So one observation is that, in fact, so how are typical ranks related to the generic rank over C? So in fact, it's fairly easy to show the following. So it happens that the minimal, so let's call this theorem 2, theorem 2, minimal typical rank is equal to generic rank of xc. Well, xc is just the complexification of x. Right, so I have my real variety, 
if you want, it's defined by some real equations, and then I take these equations of, of the real radical ideal, and I look at what they define over C, that's XC. Okay, and what I'm claiming is that the minimal typical rank is the same as the generic rank of the complexification. So now I don't want to take, sort of make a big deal out of this. I would say that for experts this would be a very easily believable statement because, because you know, what, what's happening here is there is some dimension count. And this dimension count should not really see whether you're working over R or over C, meaning that, uh, you know, if, if your dimension is sort of big enough to fill the entire space over C, then it should be possible to fill it up over R. And for example, I mean, this has been shown in several instances before. So for example, Friedland for some, uh, for some tensor ranks, and probably you can extend the proof for you know, any tensor rank, but, uh, but I have not seen it sort of stated in this generality, and the proof is also very simple. Like, it's a general proof, very simple proof, so, uh, yeah, so it happens that the minimal, the minimal typical rank is equal to just the generic rank. Of course, now we could say, well, what about the maximal rank, so then... Can I, can I ask a yeah. silly question? Probably said that. So the real points are the risky dents. Yes. That's the assumption. That's right. That's that, that's right. So when yeah, when X is a real variety, it's a variety with yeah with dense real points. That's what it is. Okay. So now what can we say over R? So essentially, kind of the same statement as over C. So the maximal maximal X rank is at most two times minimal typical x. Okay. <coughs> all right, so I have stated all of the three theorems that I wanted for my first part of the talk. So uh, yeah, I'm about to prove theorem one or theorem three are there, uh, are there any questions? Are we good? All right. So let me present. Uh, so in fact, the most difficult thing about theorem 1 and theorem 3 is defining all of the relevant things. The proof can be contained in uh, one picture. Uh, and in fact, that's still a thousand words. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. Well, in this case, I think. If one were to rewrite this proof in words, a thousand would be very general. So let me give a proof of theorem one and theorem three at the same time. So if you have a minimal typical rank, or if you have the generic rank, this means that the set of tensors of this rank contains an open ball in the Euclidean topology. So here is my open ball of tensors of rank, either generic rank or minimal typical rank. Here is a point P that I want to decompose. How am I going to decompose? Well, let me just draw a line through P and this open ball. All right, this line is going to intersect the open ball in infinitely many points. Let me take two, x, y. And there we are. I gave you the canal P is a linear combination of x and y. Right? I know that you know, rank of x is generic or minimal typical. I know that the rank of y is generic or minimal typical. So altogether, I will have it most twice. Right. I have a decomposition of P as a sum of two points. That's it. All right. So this proves simultaneously theorem one and theorem three. Yeah, I think yeah, a thousand words would be very generous for this. Okay. Um, right. So now you could ask, well, but all right, uh, is this any good? So let me part one point two. Um, so that's my imprecise, uh, I mean, in some sense, this sort of subsumes the question of, uh, is this sharp? So, well, let me first remark that, I mean, if uh, you see, somehow this, this bound uses a non-trivial quantity, with, which is the generic x rank, or well, minimal typical is equal to the generic. That's how I will get my hands on the minimal typical anyway. So. In a way, and you know, this, this, to prove what the generic rank is sometimes could be quite difficult, actually. So if you actually want to see a bound in a specific case for a specific x, then you know, we're 
we're basically piggybacking off of the work of, you know, long history of work of other people of finding what the generic rank is. So in this way, I would say that it's like I'm a midget standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Uh, but still, uh, I think that this is really the best, the best sort of all-purpose upper bound uh, that we know. And somehow, in, in some cases, it actually happens to be better than the special upper bounds that were, you know, that were derived specifically for, uh, for x. And yeah, so just, uh, I mean, a general remark, I mean, what do you expect the generic rank to be? So what do you expect this upper bound to give? What is twice generic rank? Well, it's something like 2 times n plus 1 divided by dimension x plus 1. Right? I mean, this is approximately what the bound says. Right, because that's what you would expect. You just you would expect to take your dimension of the vector space and divide by the dimension of variety plus one, right? And then you just double it. So you know. So basically, you know, if x is not a curve, if dimension of x is more than one, then you get an improvement. Uh, I mean, you get sort of a only a constant multiple, but less than one, of the trivial upper bound of n plus one. And somehow, just getting you know getting something that's asymptotically better than n plus one is not easy. It's not easy in many cases. So that's uh, that's why it works. So I just want to mention maybe uh, a couple of examples where I think this bound is, uh, even though its general purpose is really the best known bound, certainly the best known asymptotically. So uh, yeah. So example. So couple of examples. So one example is uh, symmetric tensor rank. So here, outside of a few sort of specific cases, this is the well, yeah. So this bound is certainly going to be uh, the best known asymptotically. And outside of a uh, few small cases it's actually the best known and it improves bound by uh, Yelyashev, is that right? Uh, I ask Yarek, so this is uh, Yarek Buczynski's master student, maybe now a PhD student uh, which, which is also an improvement of bounds by Bialinsky, Berula and Shinzo And uh, another example, and of course the generic rank is just given to us by the Alexander Hershowitz theorem. It's a well-known quantity that essentially is exactly behaves like this, except for a few uh, known exceptions, defective exceptions. And the other, another example, let me, I guess, shouldn't write too low. So another example where this is the best known bound is uh, tensors of a format 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 2. So, which was already mentioned uh, in the previous talk. Okay, so here the generic rank is again the expected thing uh, and this is by a work of uh, Catalizano, Keramito and Chimigliano And I mean, so the, yeah, this, this is generic, so we get twice the generic rank uh, is our bound. And I think the best known upper bound was something like 2 to the n minus 2. This is by a work of uh, Sumi, 
Samata. I mean, in many cases, it's not really possible uh, to say that this bound is an improvement of something because there are actually very few bounds on the maximal rank. So in some cases, this would really be the only bound on maximal rank. So I cannot really say, well, you know, this is, we improve something because something was not there before, and especially for real. For real, it's even, it seems to be harder to find bounds on maximal real rank. Uh, but this works, and again, you know, the reason that this works is because we're, we're relying on some non-trivial quantity because it's for real it's two times minimal typical X rank but then we know that this is the same as the generic X rank over C and then well we need to find what it is I mean this is just the expected number you need to show that this is really the case but then you double it and you get the upper bound Um, yeah, I mean, is this going to, do I expect this to be sharp? No. Uh, do I mean, I generally I expect that this is not so great, but in the, but in a sense it's also not so bad because, you know, in a, you know, in a sense if you look at, get there, okay, you know, if you look at, for example, well, whatever, theorem 1 or theorem 3, you, you know that there are, you will know, oversee all of the tensors, uh, this probability one have the generic rank, and here we're saying that the maximum that was twice that. So in a way, it already says it cannot be too bad. Right? You cannot miss by too much. But still, I would expect that you know this is really not sharp in general. So it should be possible to do better, but not clear how. Okay. So I think this brings me to the end of part one. Are there questions about part one? Yes, there is there some dissatisfaction with uh, anything? Can you say this one second proof just one more time in slow motion? Yes, okay, in slow, okay. So I have an open ball of <laughs> tensors. <laughs> okay, I have an open ball of tensors of a certain rank, either minimal, typical, or, uh, or generic. Right? Now I have my point P that I want to decompose. So I draw a line through P and the open ball. It's going to intersect at an infinitely many points, but I just take two. And now, so if I have these two points, and the third one is on the line, this means that P is a linear combination of X and Y. Uh, you know, each one of X and Y, it can be decomposed in, uh, you know, in this many, so I just need to double it to get the decomposition of P. I mean, this gives you a decomposition, right? I don't claim that it's, this gives me a decomposition of P in at most this many sum ends, that's how I know that the X rank of P is at most that. And I, I can do that for any point. So, um, what, what if uh, instead I took a line from P to a point of like minimal rank? Well, but then you need to know, you see, you need two points of intersection. Yeah, so I, I take a ball around this point of minimal rank, and then I write P as a sum of the point of minimal rank plus a point maybe of maximal rank. But it has a plus point of maybe generic rank. Well, okay, so the so problem... let's say generic rank plus minimal rank is already good enough? But, no, no, you see, okay, over C there is only one generic rank. Uh, so, well, yeah, so, so, you, so then the answer is no. The answer is if you write, if you go, if you take, let's say, point of rank 1, and you take your point P and you draw a line, this line does not have to intersect points of generic rank. Aha, uh -huh. okay. That's the right. right, so, yeah. No, no. But wait, no, no, that's not. Yeah, if it doesn't, then you get something yeah, even better. Well, there might be only points of high rank. A high rank. I mean, how do you know? The, yeah, I see. <coughs> okay. You see, generic, and you basically you just only have a line, right? Generic rank can miss the line, or even things below generic rank can easily miss a line. There is no. I mean, right, otherwise, you will prove that it's at most no, no, generic I, I, rank plus one. Yeah, in fact, you just take a point on the tangent line to the, yeah. The, yeah. the rational normal curve and there you see you can't you can't do that trick. Right. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. So let's move on to uh, part two of the talk. So part two I still intended to keep uh, elementary, almost as elementary as this. 
as part one. Okay. So part two deals with possible typical ranks. So actually already theorem two says what is the minimal typical rank? Uh, that's the just generic rank of X C. I mean, okay, this still might not be easy quantity to get your hands on, but much better understood and certainly with a long history of uh, uh, studying this, so okay. So now what what happens with typical ranks? So I guess my story starts with a paper of uh, Camon and Ottaviani and they looked at symmetric rank <coughs> or if you want wearing ring of bivariate forms or if you want bivariate tensors but I prefer the polynomial language bivariate forms tensors okay and so what did they show so they showed that typical rank typical rank of a bivariate form of degree D is at most D in fact the maximal rank is also D and at least D plus 2 over 2 like this and okay so th this quantity we can also identify as the uh, as the generic rank of a bivariate form okay so that uh, that's clear that to show that it's at most D is also not hard uh, so they showed this, uh, and they showed that in degree 5, so when D is 5, you get three typical ranks, 3, 4, 5. So, okay, I'm sorry. And also, these guys, the, the top, the upper bound, and the lower bound are guaranteed to be typical. So they show that this is typical, they show that this is typical, and you have to be in between. You have to be in between, and when they, then when the degree is 5, you only have one number in between, which is 4, and they show that this is also typical. Okay, so this means that in degree 5 there is an open ball of uh, forms of uh, symmetric rank 3, then there is an open ball of forms of uh, symmetric rank 4, and there is an open ball of forms of symmetric rank 5. Okay, and, uh, and they conjectured that in fact this is always the case, meaning that you know, every rank between the minimal typical rank and the maximal typical rank is typical. So this was their conjecture. Um, <coughs> Okay, so, uh, well, this is now the next part is, uh, I would say, slightly embarrassing for me. So, because, th so thinking about, so I thought about this conjecture and uh, I was able to solve it. Uh, so, this, so conjecture, let me write it in words. So, every rank uh, between minimal typical. and maximal and maximal typical so I'm writing it in a suggestive way is also typical so I mean this was conjecture just for bivariate forms and uh, uh, yeah I was able to prove it but in fact I guess the embarrassing part for me is that uh, this statement Sorry. Yeah, this statement is very general, right? This has nothing to do, nothing to do with bivariate forms. It just works for X rank, for a rank with respect to any variety, any rank between the minimal typical rank and the maximal typical rank is also typical. Okay, so let me. So this is this is something that we realized, and I was talking with uh, Alessandro Bernardi and Giorgio Ottaviani. We realized that this is really. Uh, this is really the case. There is nothing special happening for bivariate forms. Okay, so let me let me state the theorem. So what does the theorem say? So suppose suppose <coughs> rank R is typical and rank R plus 1 is not. 
right? So basically, suppose that we've, we'll find the typical rank, but then the rank one up from it is not typical. So then, if I look at the so S less than or equal to R, these are all tensors. Actually, let me, yeah. I just need a little bit more space. S less than or equal to R. These are all ten, these are all vectors, sorry, because it's X rank. These are all vectors of rank at most R. Okay? So then if I look at the interior <coughs> of the set, it's guaranteed to have interior because this rank is typical. Rank R is typical. And if I look at the closure, this is the entirety of the space. So it says exactly what we want. It says that if you find the typical rank, and the rank above it is not typical, then you basically have almost the entire space. Right? There is no more. There is no. There are no vectors left uh, for uh, for higher rank to be typical. Okay. Why? Uh, well, because the, uh, because the, okay. So interior is some open set, and the closure is the whole thing. So there is no way to fit an open ball. You know, for, for tensors of uh, higher rank. So which closure are you taking? Is the Euclidean question? topology. Everything here is in Euclidean topology. That's okay. Okay. That's and these are semi-algebraic sets. So, you know, so there is no weirdness of behavior here. So back to understand correctly the theorem and the conjecture are equivalent? Uh, oh, okay. So the conjecture, the conjecture was for this situation. I just wrote it in the suggestive form because, in fact, uh, so the conjecture was to say that you know, every rank between d plus 2 over 2 uh, ceiling and d is typical, right? But I can write it generally, and in fact, it happens to be true. So this is what we realized later. So the conjecture was just to prove this statement for this specific case. That's what was conjectured. I see. Okay, but now I'm saying that, and, and I had to prove... Theorem is true in general for any variety. Exactly. For essentially, for any, if you want, x can be a semi-algebraic set. I don't know if it's interesting in this generality, but there is nothing very special happening here. He's restating it to suggest the proof. Stating it this way suggests the proof. Well, yeah, to suggest, yeah, to suggest the, the generalization. That's right. I mean, because when I proved it, I had some specific way dealing with bivariate forms, but there is nothing, there is nothing special happening here, I guess is what I'm saying. So this really works in general. Questions? Maybe a comment just uh, for reference that in the special case when X was given by tensor, this was proven independently by Shmuel Friedland, exactly the, the a reformulation of the conjecture. I see. Yeah, so good. <laughs> So the thing is, uh, if you take like the most basic example, two by two by two tensors over reals, so you know that that's two typical rank, like yeah. two and three. So if you take the interior of uh, S, if R equals two. Uh, it's yes, uh, yeah. So it's less than. Uh, yeah. So okay. So if so there are two ranks, two and three. Yes. Right. So what I'm saying is, that if you take R is equal to three, then I will take all of the tensors of rank at most three. Uh, but you take r equals 2, right? If I take r equals 2, then rank 3 is still, then it doesn't satisfy the hypothesis. Right? Because it has to be rank r is typical, but rank r plus y is not. Uh, other questions? Comments? So, yeah, I, I'm brave enough to actually think that I can even present a proof of this. Uh, because it's very easy. Say, yeah. The semi-algebraic set could, the case could be very interesting if you go to non-negative rank type situations. So there should be a correspondent analogous statement. That's right. I mean, if, if I show you, I will show you the proof. And the proof does not depend in any way of having an underlying variety. Yeah. OK. So right. So let me proceed. Let me show you the proof. So how does one prove something like this? Uh, I guess the answer is very quickly, but not, uh, but not with one picture, sadly. OK, so I'm going to need a lemma, which I'm not going to prove, which just deals with structure of semi-algebraic set. So, so if S is a semi-algebraic set, then I, want, I will claim the following, that the interior of the closure of S is contained in the the closure of the interior of S. 
So let me just say, this is something that's somewhat special to semi-algebraic sets. Imagine you take the set of all rational points, you know, in Rn. Then this will not be true, because the interior of the closure is going to be the whole thing, but the closure of the interior is going to be nothing. Right? So I am using something special about semi-algebraic sets, but not very special. Right? It just says that, you know, you cannot have something that is terrible from this point of view like Q. Okay? All right. So now, so this is, this I'm not going to prove. This I'm just going to assume. But now let's, uh, let's try to do the proof. So let's look at the interior of S. So let's look at the interior of the set of all vectors of rank at most R plus 1. Okay, so I claim that this thing better be contained in the closure, sorry, I will always forget less than or equal to. In the closure of the set of vectors of rank at most r. <coughs> so basically, what am I saying? If I look at the interior of things of rank at most r plus 1, I better be able to approach them by vectors of rank at most r. And why is that? It's because r plus 1 is not typical. You know, basically, if I find a point P that isn't here, but is not approachable, so it, it has rank at most R plus 1, but in fact, because it's not approachable by things of rank at most R, it actually has rank exactly R plus 1, right? And then I can also find an open ball around it, right? What does it mean that it's not in the closure? There is an open ball. Then I will have that R plus 1 is a typical rank, right? This is just, right, this is actually proof that R plus 1 is typical. It's a certificate, right? So, okay, so then this is true. So the interior of a uh, set of vectors of rank at most r plus 1 is contained in closure of vectors of rank at most r. But this means that I can also take the interior right, because this is an open set, so it better be contained in an open subset of this. So I can take the interior. And now I can make the switch, right? The switch that's guaranteed to me by the lemma, because these are semi-algebraic sets. So the interior of S, you know, vectors of uh, rank at most r plus 1, uh, is contained in the closure of the interior of vectors of rank at most r. And, you know, now I can, should also be able to take a closure here because it's contained in a closed set. So finally, the interior, the closure of the interior of things of rank R plus 1 is contained in the closure of the interior of things of rank at most R. So what, okay, so you might think that, let me say in words what this statement is really saying, right? So that it doesn't look like I'm just manipulating symbols on the board here. So what am I really saying? I'm saying that if I take a point, so let me just say let, that A is going to be the, this, this guy, the closure of the interior of things of rank at most R. What am I really saying? I'm saying take a point in here, add any point from the cone of X. Somehow the set doesn't grow, right? Because some, So basically, to, how do I get to things of rank R plus 1? I add one point from X, right? But somehow the set doesn't grow. Right, the set doesn't grow, how can it be? Well, intuitively, it just means that the only way that it could be is that if A was the entire, space, the entire vector space to start, to start with, right? How can it be that I take, this, uh, I take this set and I add any point from X and it doesn't grow? Okay, so let me, now let's make this intuition precise. So let's make this intuition precise without dropping the uh, eraser. OK, so let me take a point P and A. So it's a closure of things uh, of the interior of things of rank at most R. So this means that there exists PI in the interior of A, PI going to P. OK, and now imagine that I take P plus X where x is in the cone. 
So what's going to happen? Well, I will have pi plus x go to p plus x. And the thing is that pi plus x, well, they're certainly in the interior of uh, tensors of rank, uh, sorry, of vectors of rank at most r plus 1. And so, so what does this mean? So these guys are in here. They converge to p plus x, so therefore p plus x is in the closure And uh, this, we just showed, is contained in A. So basically, what did I show? I said that I take P and A, and I add any point from X hat to it, and I still have that P plus X is in A. Right, so basically, I take a point in A, I add any point from the cone, I still stay in A. This can only happen if A is the entire space. Why is that? Because I can keep adding points, right? So it means that if I know that p plus x is in A, this means by induction, p plus the sum of any number of xi are also in A. But now, you know, basically, if I take, for example, k to be equal to n plus 1, then I just have the whole space, right? Because I can basically I can just keep adding points from the cone, but if I take dimension many points from the cone, I already have everything, right? And this keeps staying in A, so A is the whole thing, okay? And that's uh, that's that's the proof. Is uh, almost nothing happening here, almost. Okay. Questions about this? Yeah. Does it happen often that the maximum rank is also typical? Yeah, so this is okay. So, yeah, let me move on to my finishing remarks, which uh, yeah, should finish the talk. So, uh, so some open questions. Uh, yeah, so it's not true. It's not always true. Although the problem is that somehow, I mean, we just understand maximal rank so poorly and maximal typical rank also very poorly. So it's hard to say, you know, how often do things happen. But for example, for ternary cubics, it is known that the maximal rank is 5, but it is not typical. So it can happen that the maximal rank is not typical. I don't know if I can make a statement that, you know, should the minimal, should the maximal rank be usually not typical. So for example, for bivariate forms, maximal rank is typical. But should it be often? Uh, that's not clear, so I gave maybe question one, and, you know, what is the relationship? Can we, say, can we say something? Maybe the maximal typical rank is not too different from maximal rank, even if they're not, not exactly the same between maximal typical rank and maximal rank. Okay, so, and really uh, a baffling question to me is the following, so that we realized when we were working on the paper with Zach. So, you would think that the maximal rank over R should be at least as big as the maximal rank over C. But this is not clear. I mean, of course, if you take a real, if you take a real vector and you try to decompose it as a sum of real points, this is strictly more difficult than if you allow yourself some complex points. Right, but it is not clear that the point of maximal rank has to be real. Right? Maybe there are complex points that have maximal rank, and they have, you know, then you know, they have nothing to do with the real points. So, uh, is it true? Is max rank sub R uh, at least max rank sub C? Or what can be said? So I, uh, in, in tensor examples, I don't know of any instance when these two things are not equal. Right? Yeah, but you know, maybe I, I have not thought about it in generality of x rank. Maybe, you know, maybe there is some choice of strange varieties x where this is, would be obvious that this one is that the real one is strictly bigger than the complex one. But for you know, somewhat natural varieties of tensors, I don't know of a single example where we know that the real rank 
is bigger than uh, is bigger than complex rank. And then finally, let me add and with the open the final question. So let me sort of make uh, this interpretation of the theorem theorems well theorem one I guess. So what is theorem one saying? It is you can also think about it as saying something about border rank and rank, right? Because if you have a vector of generic rank, it's the same as saying that its border rank is as large as possible. Right? So basically theorem one says theorem one says that if border rank is large, by large I mean as large is the largest possible, is the largest possible, then true rank is not much bigger. Uh, well, it, it's at most twice as big, but I just want to say it in a, in a suggestive way. Right? So if border rank is large, then the actual rank can be at most twice as big. Right? But what can be said when the border rank is small? I mean, you, you cannot get a constant bound, but per, perhaps you can have something, the, a reasonably nice statement, you know. And so, for example, JM earlier uh, this semester asked me a question that can be exactly formulated like this. You can talk to him, for example, for some, or EV or to me, I also know the question, for some exact formulations. Uh, but basically, you can sort of ask, what is the relationship between border rank and rank? Can we say, can we have some reasonably nice bounds on, on true rank given border rank? Because in case border rank is large, in fact, true rank is not so terrible. So maybe there is some hope for having reasonable statements. Um, OK, so I think I actually like a couple of minutes over time. So thank you for your attention. So the thing is, uh, uh, you know, one of the open questions about uh, typical ranks for tensors, not symmetric tensors, is that whether there can be more than two values that occurs as uh, typical rank. So all the known example involve like three, four, but never like three, four, five. Is that, uh, is that really true? Um, Jojo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we, nobody knows. Yeah, nobody it's a very knows. nice question and should be answered. Yeah. Oh, you mean that if you feel so for symmetric, uh, for symmetric guys, we will, I mean, basically it's, I mean, we know how, I mean, well, already by variant guys you can have as, as many as you want. That's right. I see, but you're saying that if you look at the, uh, at, variety, yeah, the segregate variety, it's not actually known that the, uh, that, that there are more than two. Uh, I see. So it's just a matter of finding a, well, it's a matter of proving a good example, right? That's not finding a good example. Finding is probably easy. Proving might be, uh, proving might be hard. Okay, I actually, I was not aware that this was, uh, that this was sort of still unsettled, but yeah, so that's something I can think of. I mean, I invite everybody to think about it, in fact. I mean, basically, I guess one thing that I want to just very quickly say, I mean, there is a lot of open stuff. I mean, you know, the development of math is not linear. People, you know, go in certain directions. There are a lot of open, or there are a lot of open questions, especially about real rank. And there are not as many tools developed. But on the other hand, we are, well, many very reasonable questions are completely open, right? So there is, I mean, from my point of view, there is a lot of opportunity to prove interesting things. But, you know, maybe with not so much tools yet as in, uh, you know, as when you do things over complex numbers. Okay. So that's kind of a hope. So that's why I invite everybody to think about this question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is two still a question? I mean, how to say, can you produce counterexamples by replacing C and R with just other fields? Oh, OK. So I have really not thought about this. So I mean, basically, uh, for, for me, I have two fields of interest, C and R. <laughs> no, that's what I would like to know about. Yes? I think that if you take over finite fields with different symmetric metrics, symmetric tensor, you can do simple computation can show that uh, some of the women don't have asymmetric decomposition. So, so over finite field, it's uh, it's uh, it's not everything. Will I see. Okay. No, but that just says this one's infinity and this one is right. So, so, so that's okay. okay. Yeah, but finite field is different. But I don't know this again. I see. So you just want to say over some subfield of a bigger field. I mean, because. Oh, you want in between. Okay, then I know. 
So I'm very interested in the multiplicative version of this. So replace the notion of addition everywhere by the notion of multiplication. So if we have a subvariety, for example, of a torus, we can have a notion of rank with respect to multiplication, coordinate-wise multiplication. So two questions. Has this come up anywhere in, in, in your work? And B, do you think the lemma and, and the, the, the theorem one will be true in that case? Um, yeah, OK. So first, yeah, this is something I have not thought about at all. So everything will be given on like based on two seconds of uh, speculative thought. Uh, but so, but but still, the answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. So I can give an example of, of this. So there is uh, dry work with a student of uh, a GM, uh, Korea. So we show that every n by n matrix can be written as a product of. Uh, generically, n over two toplets matrices. So that's a variety in the space of n by n matrices. Mm -hmm. uh, but the maximal rank that we do not know. So if you could maybe shed some light there. Oh, oh, that's I matrix see. multiplication. That's also interesting. That's right. Matrix 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 multiplication. I meant Hadamard multiplication, mm -hmm. yeah. but for both interests. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. Uh, so uh, let me ask, you know, the thing is about this, this last statement that I've written down. So border rank and, and, and true rank actually can. <laughs> Of course, you know, the thing is that it, it, it can be as, as big as you well, want. Well, so you, you need to formulate the, the, you need to formulate the correct regime. So, so the, okay, let me state a precise question. I wanted to get away with just waving my hands, but let me give you a precise question. So let me, so this is what JM asked me. So uh, if you take a symmetric tensor in n variables of degree n, okay, so it's n variables of degree n symmetric tensor. Symmetric, so form, let's say homogeneous polynomial. Uh, it, can it be true? So now you look at this asymptotically as n grows. Is it possible that the uh, that the true rank is exponentially bigger than the border rank? So you need to formulate the large, You need to formulate the correct regime to make this question. I mean, of course, you can make it as big number as you want, but that would sort of not make it exponentially bigger because in, in some parameters things just yeah. So here. The, I mean, the idea is that the dimension of the whole space of uh, forms and n variables of degree n grows exponentially in n. So now, you know, so now you cannot really, uh, so, yeah, so obvious things are out because the, the typical or the generic rank is exponential and so on, so you cannot really do too much with that, right? So now the question is, is it true that, if, is it possible that the true rank is exponentially larger than border rank? This is a, this is a precise instance of this question, right? So, just to state the question a little bit more precisely, you assume that the border rank is growing like a polynomial in n, and is the true rank can the true rank grow exponentially? Yeah, exponentially in n, but it's the same, well, almost the same as exponentially in the border rank. But okay, super polynomially. Yeah. Yeah. But you, assume the, but you assume the border rank is small enough that it's polynomial. Yeah, so the border rank, that's right. So the border rank is small. Is it true that the true rank is also small, meaning not exponential or polynomial? Yeah, in that as well. Yeah. So the thing is that the, you, of, of course, you know, all your results were about real thing, complex, right? Does it work well, for instance, a tropical uh, semi ring, for example? Um, the typical rank and maximal rank, that's the one I was thinking of. The relation between typical rank. So, I mean, so, so some things should transfer, some things maybe not. I mean, here I'm using properties of semi algebraic sets that you have to be quite careful. So, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I cannot immediately say one way or the other uh, what's, going to, what's going to happen. But, I mean, my feeling is that some phenomena should be general. Right? Some phenomena should be general. Are they sufficiently general to transfer? Then I'm not sure, but probably. Something is general enough here. Okay, so let's stand right. Yeah, because that's the important.